I found it quite a challenge to try and prepare a talk of under 30 minutes or so covering that chapter. We'll see how we get on. But just before we look at uh, Daniel chapter 6 in, in detail, let me be very honest with you. You would like me to be honest with you, wouldn't you? Some of you would, some of you wouldn't. But actually, I understand that the leadership of this church tonight wanted to get the very best preacher that they could. But I, I believe that when he was approached, he couldn't come. He wasn't available. So it's decided that the leadership then would try and get the very best Bible teacher that they could think of. But again, sadly, when they approached him, he couldn't come for whatever reason. And so I believe under the influence of some of the ladies in the church, it was decided to try and get the most charismatic and best-looking preacher that they could find. But again, sadly, he wasn't available. So that's when Derek Robinson rang me, and I thought to myself, well, I'd better accept, because I'd already said no three times. <laughs> I have to confess that's not true. <laughs> Let's go to Daniel 6 and verses 1 and 2. The context here is well into the period of Israel's 70 years of captivity or exile in Babylon. Daniel, by this time, was well over 80 years of age. He'd previously been a governor or administrator in Babylon, having been appointed by King Nebuchadnezzar. We read that in chapter 2 and verse 48. But here, Daniel is administrator or overseer in the new Medo-Persian reign under Darius. Now, Darius himself was in his 60s, and historical records suggest that he took charge of Babylon after the death of Nebuchadnezzar. Historical records also are actually a bit confusing in that some suggest that Darius only reigned for two years before King Cyrus took over. Other records suggest that Darius was a sub-king under Cyrus. It's not really important for us tonight. But it says there in verse 2 that the king might not suffer loss. That was referring to the collection of the taxes. The king was probably concerned for his own financial wealth above everything else. Now, I think it's true to say that ancient pagan monarchs had no true conception of government for the people. Sadly, I think it's a bit similar today. If we go to verses 3 to 5, Daniel, with over 50 years of diplomatic service behind him, was highly regarded in the land for his integrity and his ability to do his job well. He was trustworthy, upright, courageous, and he had a commendable attitude. He was an example to us all. Daniel had a right spirit within, he had an excellent spirit, and I have to say, an excellent spirit will always bring promotion. God is not against promotion, he just wants it done his way and in his time. I heard a preacher once say, if you obey God, you will not stay where you are, you will be in line for promotion. But Jesus said in Luke 14, verse 11, if you are humble, you will be exalted in due time. I have to say, our humility must be genuine because God knows the intents and purposes of our hearts. He knows our true motivation in everything. Jesus also said in Luke 16, verse 10, 
If you're faithful in little, you will be trusted with much more. And so that's the test for us, to be faithful in whatever we have to do. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 13 says, Never tire of doing right. Never tire of doing right. Now with regard to Daniel, I can't help thinking of the value of age and experience in positions of high responsibility. Perhaps I'm a bit biased there. But with Daniel's position of prominence also came dangers of envy and jealousy from other people. And sadly, it's something that you find even in the church, even in these days. And so for each one of us as a child of God, we have to check, check our hearts all of the time. Because jealousy is a great block to the Holy Spirit. And it can cause us to do the most irrational things. The example that comes to mind is back in Genesis 26, where Isaac and his men, they'd dug a number of wells, and the Philistines had come along and blocked the wells up. And this was in a time of famine. The Philistines were jealous of Isaac and how God was blessing him. And so they came and blocked those wells up, even though there was a terrible famine in the land. If we go to verses 6 to 9, now Daniel had been circumspect in obeying the laws of the land, but his enemies knew that when the law of the land conflicted with the law of his God, Daniel would always obey God first. And as the people of God, that is the way it must be for us also. As persecution against Christianity and Christians increases in these days, the reality is that we may well be faced with similar situations. And the question is, will we stand up for Jesus or will we deny him? to save our own skin. I have to say last week uh, I felt prompted to sign a, a petition to the BBC because the BBC has a religious advisor who's a Muslim and it's his plan and intention to reduce the number of Christian programs and I don't know if you've noticed it but there is an increasing bias towards support for Muslims and the Muslim faith. So I signed this petition protesting against this move of the BBC. I'm reminded of Polycarp, a bishop in Smyrna. I'm very glad I've got a name, Roger. Much more simple than Polycarp. But in AD 155, Polycarp was dragged into the amphitheater in Smyrna to face the Roman proconsul, who with threats ordered him to swear by the genius of Caesar and to revile the Christ. And Polycarp replied, 86 years have I served Christ, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who saved me? And Polycarp was taken and burned at the stake, but a wind suddenly arose and blew the flames away from him. And Polycarp was only killed through the sword of a soldier. Now, under the law of the Medes and Persians, once a royal decree had been issued, it could not be revoked, even by the king himself. It remained in force until its time of expiration. And the practice of, uh, of creating an unchangeable law may follow from the idea that changing a decree was an admission that it may have been faulty in the first place. The strength of the plan of the administrators and the satraps lay in taking advantage of Darius's vanity. As a man in his 60s, he knew that if he was ever to achieve glory or notoriety, it was probably now or never. And by the way, their claim that all the councillors had been consulted was almost certainly not true, for there is no record that Daniel 
was ever consulted. We could just move on to verses 10 to 12. Undeterred by the royal proclamation, Daniel immediately prayed to God. And we read that he prayed facing Jerusalem, the city of God, and notice he had the windows open. That's not to, nothing to do with it being a hot day. He wasn't trying to hide away. He wasn't trying to do it in secret. He was very open in his faith and his trust in God. What Daniel was doing, praying to God in this way, was an act of courage and an act of witness. And that pattern of praying three times a day, I would suggest, is a good one for us. To pray morning, noon, and night. See, if we are serious about God and our faith in him, we will seek him with all our hearts, especially in times of danger. And I'm not being alarmist, but I would have to say that I think we are living in days of increasing danger, especially as Christians. Now, Daniel's enemies were right in assuming that if Daniel was forced to choose between the decrees of an earthly king and the eternal word of the king of kings, he would always choose God. We move on to verses 13 and fif to 15. We notice there that Daniel's accusers did not describe him as an administrator or governor, as was done in verse 2, but rather he was described as one of the exiles from Judah. And I believe they did this in order to try and implicate him in a treasonous act. And through his vanity, Darius dug himself into a hole from which there was no easy way out. And that's a lesson for us. Think what we are likely or even possible, what are the likely or possible outcomes of our actions. In other words, it's always wise to think before we act. In verse 16, the Aramaic word, for den literally means a pit, suggesting that it was dug into the ground. It was below ground level. And notice the king still retained his fondness for Daniel, and Daniel's faith witnessed to the king. And I have to say I believe in the coming days and in these days that our faith will witness to people that people in the world are watching us as Christians. Especially in the days to come, if things do get harder, they're going to be watching how we cope with things, how we deal with possible hardships, and it will speak to them. <coughs> Our actions very often speak to people far more than uh, our words. If we go on to verse 17... Now, to ensure that the den or the pit remains, remained closed and that no effort could be made either by the king or his officials to intervene, the lid or the stone over the entrance to the pit was impressed with the royal seal and also with the seals of the king's noblemen. And so the lid of the pit or den could not be removed without the breaking of the seals. Here we read that the king could not eat or sleep. I wonder why that was. I would suggest it was because his conscience, and also I believe it was through the conviction of the Holy Spirit. A good conscience, I have found, aids a good night's sleep. Now notice that the king refers to God as the living God, suggesting that he had more than an element of belief. God was at work in his heart, and the later verses, as we will see, indicate that he almost certainly became a believer. Although Daniel had to undergo a mighty test of his faith, 
God had another purpose to achieve. And that was the salvation of Darius, who witnessed to and gave confession of his faith to the peoples of his land. <coughs> we see that in verses 25 to 27. If we could just put those up. 20, could we skip to verses 25 to 27? And it says in verse 25, Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. I believe those words were uttered under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That God uses the most unlikely of circumstances to reveal his supernatural power and to reveal that he is the one true God. If God can shut the mouths of the lions in Daniel's pit, we must believe his power to restrain that very noisy lion who is the devil himself and to protect his people. Psalm 46 verse 1 tells us that our God is an ever-present help in times of trouble. Now we either believe that or we don't. And my friends, how often do we, I know it's true of me, we so often leave God as the last resort. We try to sort out our problems, resolve them in our own strength, our own good ideas. And when that doesn't work, then finally we turn to God. If only we would go to God first. It would save a lot of time and a lot of heartache. Our God is an ever-present help in trouble. Could we pop back to verses 21 and 23 of Daniel 6? <clears throat> Bless you. Slightly ironic, I think, that Daniel's faithfulness got him into, his, into trouble in the first place, but his great faith got him out of it. And I'm so glad that Daniel is referred to in the great list of men and women of faith, which is in Hebrews 11. And I just want to read what it says about Daniel in Hebrews 11 and verse 33. Let me just read that to you. talks about uh, great men who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the, fire, the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. So Daniel is included there in that great list of men and women of such wonderful, wonderful faith. And notice in verse 24 of Daniel 6 that the entire families of the wicked conspira conspirator conspirators, conspirators, they were destroyed because the Persians, like the Hebrews and the other Semites, considered guilt to be a collective responsibility, especially as families were concerned. We find similar examples in the Bible. In Numbers chapter 16, there was Korah, who was put to death, and his own whole family were also killed. Achan, in Joshua chapter 7, they illustrate the same principle, that whole families were put to death as a result of a man's sin. And that is a warning for us. We must never treat God lightly. Have to remember, in all things and at all times, he is Lord. He is the creator of all things. And one day each one of us will have to stand before his throne and give an account of how we've lived our lives. And then finally, in verse 28, we see how God 
honoured Daniel. And the truth is, God will always honour and reward men and women who show great faith. And my prayer for us tonight is that we might become great men and women of faith. For sure in the coming days, I believe our faith is going to be tested. We will have to stand and give an account. We're going to have to make decisions, maybe the, the like of which we've never made thus far, to choose between the laws of the land if they contradict greatly the laws of our God. Who will we serve? Will we be like Daniel and stand up for Jesus, stand up for our God? We will decide to serve our God, come what may, even if it means hardship. You know, eternity is a long time. This life is very, very short. The Bible describes it just like a puff of smoke or a blade of grass that is here one day and gone the next. Eternity is forever. And I would like to think that for all of us, that as we stand in faith, as we acknowledge our God, that we will have great reward in heaven. Jesus said, build up for yourself treasure in heaven. And that's the most important thing, to build up our treasure in heaven as we look to him, as we trust him with all our hearts. And one thing I know is that he will never, never let us down. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, we got through Daniel 6 quite well, didn't we? And we're going to sing our last song of praise and worship and let's acknowledge that God forgave my sin and Jesus name and that's the wonderful truth tonight Jesus has forgiven our sin we've been washed clean hallelujah we're covered with his eternal robe of righteousness <laughs>